Good morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with your State of the Industry update. Now, first, I need to address the elephant in the room, and that is that you might have noticed that these videos are coming out more slowly. The reason is because I posted a poll the other day, and uh, the results were almost unanimous. Um, Y'all wanted me to focus on making higher quality videos with lower volume, so here we have it. Um, all right, so first up today, uh, I am, uh, of course, going to plug a little bit of my own stuff. Um, is AutoMuse. So AutoMuse is my product, uh, my project of all of my um, experiments surrounding uh, fiction. So I've already done experiments with half a dozen or so different tools um, using GPT-3 uh, for creating fiction tools, um, such as uh, Synopsis Creator, um, scene to scene, like uh, converting um, uh, prose to movie dialogue. Uh, and that sort of thing. And so what I'm doing is I'm getting a team together. Actually, later today, I'm having our first founders meeting. Um, so I'm building a team and we are going to launch AutoMuse as a, um, as a, as a service uh, here soon. So stay tuned. If you want to get involved, you can go to AutoMuse.io and click on contact and then just fill out the, uh, the uh, beta access uh, list. Um, alternatively, you can sign up and support me on Patreon, and uh, Patreon supporters will be given uh, right of first refusal uh, priority access to the closed beta. And then, of course, as things um, ramp up. Uh, but yeah, so go ahead and, and sign up here um, or sign up on Patreon, and, um, and you can uh, get updates on AutoMuse as we progress. I'll be, of course, posting um, here, things here on YouTube. Um, one of the next things that's going to happen publicly is we'll be working on putting together a Kickstarter campaign. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, that's probably going to be the next big announcement for AutoMuse. Moving right along, the next big thing we have to announce today is Google's LMNav uh, self-navigating uh, robot, self-driving, self-navigating robot. Now, this is really exciting because this is, it does a few things. Um, one, it uses uh, natural language instructions to tell the robot where to go and what to do, um, which, uh, you know, I proposed that a couple of years ago with natural language cognitive architecture. Um, and then we also saw something similar with SACAN, uh, which was a recent uh, paper where you could give a, 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 an articulated robot, an ar a robot with an arm, instructions like clean up this spilled soda. Uh, but now they've taken it to the next level. Um, and this is this is Google um, uh, has taken it to the next or sorry uh, yeah UC Berkeley and robotics at Google um, they've taken it to the next level and I won't play the video um, uh, two minute papers has a great video explaining it in greater detail but what I wanted to call your attention to is the fact that this is multimodal and so there's a large language model a video language model and a visual navigation model and so they have three different models working together excuse me, to understand the goal uh, and, and create its own objectives and measure its progress towards those objectives and overcome obstacles and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, uh, so like you, it's just fascinating to watch. So for a little bit of background of me, this was a like teenage dream of mine. So my cousin and I we were both electronics nerds um, and we worked on autonomous robots back in the day, but this was with like basic microcontrollers. Um, which, so a basic stamp is like the precursor to Arduino. Um, and so like you could run like 200 lines of C. I don't remember. It was not much. Um, and it was surprising with just a few rules how clever you could get a, a, an autonomous robot back in the day, right? There was challenges. This is in the 90s. Challenges of having a robot, a self-driving robot that had to navigate a maze, blow out a candle, and then navigate back to where it was. Now, of course, that is like, you know, again, just a few hundred lines of C, or, or basic rather, uh, when it was the basic stamp, Arduino runs on C, I apologize. Um, but this is orders of magnitude more sophisticated. And it's interesting when you think of like how much code was re is required to do a relatively simple task, as long as you've got the right hardware and sensors. But then if, you, if your sensor is just a camera, right? Um, and you're, you get a whole lot more information. And part of the complexity there is that amount of information that you have to process. Um, so anyways, very fascinating. This, this hits close home to me because this, is, this was a dream of mine like more than 20 years ago was, um, I, was to work on something like this. 
Um, and now here it is. And of course, I've moved on to cognitive architecture and other stuff. Um, but yeah, very fascinating paper. C check out Google's LMNAV. Um, oh, and here's the uh, here's it's up on archive as well. But honestly, their their site is um, does a good enough job of explaining it. If you do want to take a deep dive, check it out up on archive. Okay, moving right along, the uh, the next thing that I wanted to share with you was an anonymous paper. It is it's under double blind review right now, but this paper, um, if you read the abstract, it's not entirely clear what they're talking about. Um, by conditioning what, uh, on natural language instructions, large language models have, have done uh, impressive capabilities. We propose automatic prompt engineer. So prompt engineering is something that we, uh, if you're working with LLMs, you know that prompt engineering is a big thing. And so they did, they did several, <coughs> excuse me, several experiments and they were able to achieve human level prompt engineering with the LLM. So the LLM can write its own prompts. Now I have been talking about this since way back with natural language cognitive architecture. This is called meta prompting. And actually one of my more popular videos recently was about meta prompting. Um, how do you get, how do you get the machine to write its own prompts to identify what it is that it needs to do? So they are talking about this feedback loop here. Um, and you click on the PDF and they've got, um, They've got some diagrams about how it how it's done. This is a little bit more sophisticated than the video that 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 I showed you, um, because I just I was just like off the cuff, like here's here's a prompt that can write another prompt. Um, but they they're talking about how do you how do you test it, right? Because if the machine is doing its own work and own experiments without a human involved to measure how accurate or how effective it is it needs to have a way of measuring itself. So that is a that is a good advancement. So this, the implications of meta prompting are not immediately obvious. Meta prompting is critical for autonomous machines because here's an example. If you as a human are engaged with a problem that you haven't seen before, essentially what you're doing in your head as you're trying experiments is you're creating instruction sets for yourself to test, right? And then you're measuring the effectiveness of those experiments that you've done. So you say, okay, I'm stuck here. What's a problem that everyone has faced? Your car doesn't start, right? Or your car's running weird or something in your house is broken, right? And so you come up with a hypothesis. Well, first taking a big step back, you say, okay, my ultimate goal is I want my car to be running again, right? So you hold that in your mind and then you say, okay, well, you ask yourself, what do I know about cars? You turn the key, the sound that it makes changes, you know, that gives me more information. And so part of the process that you're dynamically coming up with is first, I need to gather information. Okay. Does it start? No. Okay. That doesn't work. Um, you know, do I have gas? Okay. Sure. Yes. What do I know about my car? And so what you're doing is you're constantly brainstorming ideas of how to approach the problem. And then, and then you're executing on those ideas. That's the key thing. You're brainstorming what to do, uh, or what to look for. Then you're figuring out a process, a prompt an instruction set to test it and measuring the results. And you're doing that in a loop. And so this is, this is something that I wrote about extensively in my latest book, symphony of thought, which is okay. How do you decide what these tasks are? Uh, how do you brainstorm? How do you measure your own success? And so I have a collection of dozens and dozens of prompts and other similar things. So this work is very much in line with my own work. Um, but this is specifically on that one problem of meta prompting. Um, so this is a really great paper. I'm curious as to who, who wrote it, but it says anonymous authors paper of, under double blind review. So whoever's doing this is pretty serious. Um, and I think that this is going to be a really good, really good thing. And also the, the acronym ape is not lost on me. If you're at, at all an internet denizen, you know that, um, all the people who are a big fan of the GameStop stock, they call themselves apes. So I'm just wondering if that was like a nod to that or if it's, I don't know, but anyways, there's nothing wrong with automatic prompt engineer. Um, I actually had on my backlog, um, I was going to make a video about how to make a prompt engineering chatbot. Maybe I'll do that since this paper is relevant. Um, okay. So that's about it for the, um, meta prompting paper. All right. And the grand finale for the day, the one, the, for all the cannolis is, uh, the metas make a video. So this is a text to video, um, 
uh, project by Meta. And this happened way sooner than I thought it was going to. Um, I know that, that plenty of people have been working on it. And of course, if you're on Twitter and you see all the stable diffusion, stable diffusion um, animated videos, um, you know that people figured that out very quickly. And so Meta is, has created some really decent um, uh, uh, text to video. And I'm not gonna dig into the paper. I'm just gonna sit here and appreciate how, how fast this is happening. And so it's not gonna be too long before you have um, better scenes um, that, uh, that you can then stitch together and make a full length TV show or movie. So I'm telling you like fully synthetic entertainment is coming. And then there are no limits because it's not, it's, I mean, it's technically CGI, right? Computer generated imagery, but it's not through 3d simulation. This is going to be 100% neural representations of physics, graphics, people, faces. Um, I was telling a friend of mine, um, that neural representation, um, is going to be the big thing. Like if, if you, if you take out transformers, um, the other, the alternative thing is neural representation, which of course, neural representation is something that all neural networks do, but just the concept of neural representation of whether it's places, um, people, scenes, um, stories that is going to be so big. Um, and so here we see that, that kind of prediction coming to fruition. And, um, yeah, this is, I, I'm just completely blown away, um, where, oh man, like just the, the, the number of possible things that you can do with this and they're prompting it with just a couple of images and then it's, it's taking it and run with it. And obviously like, it's really trippy. Um, uh, so I guess the most important thing to talk about here though, is what are the implications for art? So obviously things like Dolly and stable diffusion and mid journey, um, have caused a lot of consternation amongst the art community. Uh, not the least of which is because, <clears throat> excuse me, let me drink a little bit of coffee. Don't know why my throat's dry. Not the least of which is because a lot of the training data uses art from the internet. Um, and that art that people have is copyrighted. Um, it is not public domain. And so what are the ethics and legalities of using that training data? And then of course, in the future, when all the future training data, um, that is used by these AI, AI art machines was generated by AI, by AI art, like, what do you do with that? And so maybe, um, maybe the, the need for NFTs is real. And this is me saying that someone who has been skeptical of NFTs, because if you're an artist and you publish your work as an NFT, that guarantees that everyone knows you made that. And every time that image is referenced, whether it's pulled into a data set, um, you need permission to pull that image into that data set. Um, so. I think that there is probably going to be a need for NFTs because, you know, as, as a novelist, right. I'm thinking about like in my, in, in the future, when my book is published, I want everyone to read it. And I wouldn't mind if my novel is used to train a future novel writer. I mean, hell, that's what I'm working on with AutoMuse. Um, but I also want to make sure that I get credit for that. And if anyone produces something, I want to make sure they get credit for it too. So one, and this is not saying that the technology is bad, just that there are problems to solve and we have to be creative with those, with those, uh, with our solutions to those problems. Now, moving, moving on. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out that's not obvious. I don't know why they don't have this at the very top. You can sign up to use make a video research, um, uh, or make to use the make a video studio with, um, with meta, with uh, Facebook. Um, so anyways, this is very exciting. The morality and ethics and legality of it um, are, are really uh, important. Um, actually on the Discord server, on the Cognitive AI Lab Discord server, we had a really spirited discussion about um, culture. How is AI art going to impact our culture? My position is that this is going to allow um, any number of, of subcultures to really flourish. Because the thing is, is stuff like movies are really expensive to make. Um, and, and because of that, because there's a profit motive for movies, um, only movies that are going to be profitable get made, but there are millions and millions of great stories that people want to see, uh, movies of. So like, you know, I've got my bookshelf over there. There's a bunch of books that I want to see as a movie, but they're never going to get made 
because the audience is too small or they'd be too expensive to make. So I am so excited because you know what? Like one of the first things that I'm going to do, I'm getting chills thinking about this. One of the first things that I'm going to do once um, make a video like this technology is more developed is I'm going to convert my novel into a movie. I'm not going to sell it to a studio. I'm going to make my story into an AI generated movie exactly how I want it. And you know what? My, the goal is not to make money, but it's to make art. And so by, by making these really powerful art tools and democratizing access to art, I think we're going to see an explosion and we're going to be, um, we're going to be just such a hyper focused culture on exploring art and all of its different avenues. Anyways, I'm rambling. I'm proselytizing. Um, if you want to hear more of that, please let me know. I'm happy to have a, a, a live stream where I just ramble about the ethics of art and culture and how it will impact us philosophically. Anyways, I'll stop it there. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day. Um, uh, like and subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon. The, um, the advantages of supporting me on Patreon is you get um, access to my exclusive blogs but also you get bumped up to the front of the line for access to Autumn use. All right, that's it. The end. Have a good one.